What's up, gentlemen? This is Rising Phoenix Podcast, the podcast about how to rise up after your divorce. I'm your host, Michael Rhodes. Let's get into it. Uh, joining me today is Dr. Quincy. Uh, Dr. Quincy, let's just uh, jump right into it. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I'm a clinical psychologist. I specialize in trauma treatment. Um, I have a private practice in Los Angeles, California, and then I have a worldwide coaching and educational platform where we help trauma survivors and their support systems find a new way forward. Great. And that's, that's why I wanted to have you on. Uh, trauma uh, specifically fascinates me for a lot of reasons. Uh, my childhood, I think, was traumatic. And, and we can talk about you know, the grading or sort of, sort of levels of trauma that there are. Um, I, I don't know where I fall, uh, on that spectrum. I, I, nobody put cigarettes out on my arm, but, uh, mm-hmm. it wasn't a very nurturing, loving environment. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so, uh, trauma, uh, is, is, a, a um, of interest to me. And then of course the trauma of divorce, cause I, I think mm-hmm. it is a, a traumatic incident, but let's, let's hone in on the definition. What, how, how do you consider something traumatic or whether or not you've been through a trauma? So in its most basic form, we define trauma by anything that happens too much and too fast. So obviously that is going to be individual for people, however they experience life. If it's too much for your nervous system, for your cognitive abilities, for your current emotional capacity, and it is coming at you too fast, um, then you are left with sort of the outcome that is typically trauma. We do know that out of all of the trauma that happens in the world, only about 20% of people actually have a post-traumatic response. You're most likely in the world, um, the 80% of us are going to find some resilience. Now, what that means is that most people have experienced a lot of really big, bad events in their life. Um, Most people are able to, at the time, get enough support or whatever to feel like they can grow from that or or, um, sort of be resilient in the aftermath. Um, but there are some really, really tricky things that happen that at the time in our life, they just overwhelm our current systems. So for a kid, that might mean that something that we all might look at in the world as being kind of a small event, um, like maybe not traumatic to other people, it might traumatize a kid, mostly because of their emotional capacity, their current support systems, uh, their cognitive ability, whatever's going on in that moment, it overwhelms what they have at their disposal to overcome it. So at its most simple, uh, trauma is anything that happens too much and too fast for you. And so what are those, it's, I think that we talked, we talked about, there are sort of levels or, or. Yeah. So we like to think about, um, trauma in childhood specifically as sort of being on a scale. Um, I am one of the psychologists that really doesn't like, um, any sort of polarity. So if we decide that there's like some invisible line in the sand and everything that happens on this side of the line, um, is trauma and everything that happens on this side of the line is not trauma. That's usually unhelpful because you're going to miss some people. And so what I like to do is think about trauma on a scale on one end of the scale, which is probably less overwhelming in the, in the big moments of life, but it sort of happens slowly over time is the trauma of having emotionally immature parents. Now, these are parents that fall into the category of just not being able to show up to their own emotional needs or the emotional needs of their children, which can create a lot of chaos, um, destruction, um, neglect, rejection, humiliation, things like that for kids. But that is usually going to be what we would call small T trauma. So these small little events that happen over time that add up to what our brain would interpret as a traumatic event. But there's not these like big T, the house burned down. I I had to drag my parent out of the house sort of traumas. Um, It's the the smaller moments that happen every single day that whittle away at a child's self-esteem, their sense of being safe in the world, uh, their sense of being lovable, those sort of things. So that's on one end of the spectrum. In the middle, we have sort of towards the middle of the spectrum of abuse or um, trauma, we have have what we call narcissistic family systems, which is essentially a family system, a dynamic that's been well-researched out there in the, in the research community of a 
one, typically one mentally ill parent, and they typically have some level of a personality disturbance or a um, deep sort of emotional disturbance in some way. And what that means is that one parent um, creates a dynamic in the rest of the family um, that's individual. So each child, each parent that's partnered up with that person is going to have a different response in that dynamic. And that is going to create its own little system that is nor, which is not healthy nor helpful in teaching a person how to be in adult relationships as they get older. So that's what we call a narcissistic family system. Um, and, and, uh, hint here, you don't have to be a narcissist or have a narcissist in the family for a narcissistic family system. You can have parents that are borderline personality, um, uh, deeply addicted to substances. You can have all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. On the other end of the spectrum, which is what we would call the most severe version of childhood trauma is going to be childhood abuse, childhood neglect, that verbal and physical actual hurting of a child, um, or the actual physical neglect of a kid where they're not getting their needs met. They're living in cold homes. They're not going to school. Um, they don't have just sort of their very, very basic needs met. So on this spectrum, you can see that people can really fall anywhere on that spectrum. Right. Um, and they can even fall in different, uh, places on the spectrum at different times in their lives. Right. So like maybe they had a person in the family that was, that kind of created a narcissistic family system, but then they got, one of the parents got sober. And so maybe they just sort of move into like emotionally immature parents, like a sort of parenting that doesn't pay attention to emotional development in children. And they there's, they are what we would call something like a dry drunk, like a person that gets sober, but doesn't do all of the emotional work to actually grow up and, and address, you know, whatever's, um, underneath that substance abuse. So a child is going to have a different experience, right? When the parent is actually using, they might be in a narcissistic family system. And then when they're not, they may move towards just having one or two emotionally immature parents at the time. Gotcha. Now I, I want to, this might be a little bit of a rabbit hole, but they happen all the time here. And this is why I write okay, things down because of, <laughs> I forget things all the time, but how does um, those little T's uh, compare to those big T's? Like, in other words, um, if you go through the big T traumas, the physical, emotional abuse, um, how does that weigh against the smaller ones of like just being told that you're a piece of shit or whatever? You know what I mean? Well, science has actually been very kind to us in this way. We've actually been able to measure people's brains uh, when they're remembering or re-experiencing some of their childhood trauma. And what we know to be true is that when enough of the little T traumas add up, they are biologically indistinguishable from a big T trauma. So you tell a kid that they're a piece of shit enough, and that is actually going to be the very same as them feeling like their life was being threatened. Their existence was being threatened for those big T trauma moments. So I think in, from my perspective, this is why we really have to pay attention to what the lived experience is for, for the kid. Um, if they are completely um, beaten down with the things that they're going through in those little T trauma ways, we might expect their post-traumatic response to be similar to a kid who was in a terrible car accident and now has nightmares every night and um, isn't able to sort of function during the day. Those um, outcomes are probably going to be similar unless we intervene for them. Hmm. Um. Uh, you know, when, when I, when I have these types of interviews, I always, of course, filter it through, through my experiences and mm -hmm, sure. you know, it's, uh, it's, it's weird to, to, um, I mean, I know these things it's sort of, uh, intrinsically cause I feel it, but it's always sort of, uh, nice and also sad, I guess, to get mm -hmm. some sort of confirmation, but, mm -hmm. um, I'm not gonna, uh, go too far down a rabbit hole of you giving me a therapy session. So let's. <laughs> Let's, well, I, um, but on that point, let me just sort of point out that this is a very common experience for people that uh, when you start sort of thinking through your own life experiences and you hear this sort of confirmation, it feels both relieving because we've got like a name yeah. to what's going on, um, validating and those sort of experiences, especially if your trauma was chronic invalidation, right? It's going to feel good for someone 
someone to come around and be like, whoo, that was not the thing. That was not the thing that we wanted you to experience at the same time. And this is, this is very typical of anyone that has experienced trauma in the moment you're validated. It also threatens to bring up all of the negative emotional experiences around the trauma that you're being validated in. So trauma and trauma recovery is tolerating that two opposite experiences can happen at the very same time that you can be validated. And you can also be reminded of all of those terrible feelings that came up in the trauma. And both of those things have to exist at the same time. Yeah. Well, I feel it for sure. Um, Mm -hmm. It's just, it is nice to, to get that confirmation. Um, So let's move on to how this affects um, adult relationships. Like, and I don't know if we want to go like little T, big T, just trauma in general, but like how, how do these, these traumas in our childhood affect our adult relationships? Well, I have kind of come up through my own clinical work with about six different ways that this plays out. Some of those like bleed into one another, but really standing on their own, they're kind of six distinct categories and we can all have multiple reactions in each of these categories. So I'll just sort of start at the top. You ask questions and then I'll kind of work my way through the the six, if that works for you. Yeah, absolutely. So the first that I find most often with kids who have been in little T and big T trauma environments is that they become, they attempt to predict the feelings of others. So we'll see that kids will become they'll, their antennas for disruption, for the way that dad slams the door when he gets home, uh, the way that the steps happen across the living room. There's all of these different kinds of cues that a kid will come up with to try to predict how someone else is feeling. The way that this shows up in adult relationships is that someone might be busy. They might, um, um, have not put enough emojis at the end of that text message. They might not have um, responded with the same jubilation that you wanted them to. And suddenly your antennas go up because it has become your job to attempt to predict the feelings of others in relationships as a way of keeping the relationships calm, stable together, whatever that is. So that's what we'll see in a lot of adults that are kind of walking around in the world, very, very anxious and nervous about all of the seeming, um, clues that they're getting out in the world, that something ain't right in their relationships. Now, Sometimes they're right on the money. Um, And sometimes these are a misinterpretation of the cues that are going on or something that they've learned in childhood that's not been skewed in adulthood. And really the work in that is trying to decide what exactly is right about that cue? What are you right on about? And what might you have missed too? Because you might be right that someone is upset, but it doesn't mean that they're upset at you. But a a kid of trauma is going to feel like everything is about them because that's what they grew up in. Oh, yeah. Um, So that that brings up something. Um, Is that why perhaps that some of these men, myself included, we sort of have our antennas up, but we also we, we feel like everything's okay. But then all of a sudden we sort of feel like we got blindsided. Mm-hmm. But by it, by, uh, you know, I'm, I want a divorce. And, mm-hmm. and does that um, sort of compound the, the experience and even make it more traumatic because we are so attuned and we thought we knew mm-hmm. what was going on. And then this comes along and it's. Yeah. So one, another, one of the six different outcomes is avoidance or dissociation. So anything that's connected, yeah. To anything that could possibly be painful, you are both cued into, and you might also have an active campaign inside of you to avoid any reminders of how terrible you feel about yourself, how awful feelings feel, uh, what happens in relationships because they all fall apart eventually. Right. So in my opinion, that's two separate 
okay. processes that are going on at the same time. This is when I was talking about, they kind of bleed sure. into one another yeah. that there can be in, in really in any sort of trauma, our main way of surviving trauma when it's happening is a healthy amount of dissociation and avoidance. That is a, that is a very important nervous system response to not pay attention to everything that's happening because you actually need all of your brain power to get to the surviving. You need to run, you need to fight, you need to freeze, you need to fawn, you need to do something in that trauma to survive it, which means that you don't need to be paying attention to everything. You actively do need to avoid some things that's very healthy and we need it in order to survive. The problem is in the aftermath, the very reminder of trauma sets off those same avoidance triggers for us. And so in a relationship, when this is old hat, this is what you've always done, then you're very likely to both have antennas for what's going on, like maybe the um, tone of voice, the body posture, the you know tone of an email, whatever, right? You're, you're super connected to that to predict someone's feelings, but maybe you are totally out to lunch and avoidant of the bigger dynamics that are going on. Why? Because in childhood you had to avoid the bigger dynamics because in no way could we have named our dad a narcissist or named our mom emotionally explosive. The bigger dynamics were off the table to actually interpret. So your business became about the very small little things that were going on in the day, the slam of the door, the footsteps, the clanging of the dishes that would help you know what you have immediately in your future to deal with like that night at dinner or in 15 seconds when someone comes up the stairs, but the overall dynamics that would be soul crushing, right? For a kid to actually have to pay attention to mom is unhealthy in this way. And she's chipping away at my self-esteem. No kids thinking about that. Oh yeah. It would be too damaging. Yeah. That's, um, man, there's, I find this stuff so fascinating and um, just uh, I feel like I've missed my calling. I mean, I, I enjoy what I'm doing now, but um, man, I, re- I really wish I would have been a psychologist, to be honest. Well, you can always go back. I'm old. You know what well, I mean? it'll add some trauma to your bucket <laughs> to be a grad student and be chronically underpaid and all that good stuff. But it is very meaningful work. Yeah, well, but I just, you know, thankfully, there are people like yourself that, that have done it and, and, and are also able to explain it. So. Um, okay. So I got off a little track a, t- a tiny bit. So let's get back on track to, okay. uh, the third one. Okay. So we've got, um, we've named two. So the next one is controlling behaviors or emotions, your own behaviors or emotions to avoid a future trauma or some impending disaster. So the way that this happens is you stop paying attention to your own preferences You stop paying attention to what you want or need, and you start controlling your feelings. Maybe you're actually quite rageful, but we are going to totally skip over that part of the book. And we're going to move right on into whatever you need to feel in that moment to keep that other person calm. Mm -hmm. That happens a lot in childhood. Kids are rageful and they are sassy and they are mad at every little challenge to their independence. I mean, this is a normal part of emotional development, but when you're growing up in any sort of childhood trauma, you, you don't get that same emotional development. And so what's going to happen is you start changing your behaviors or your feelings, at least temporarily to try to accommodate who, whomever is in your environment that might become a trauma to you later. The way that this translates into adult relationships is that you're going to find yourself in relationships where you might not know your preferences. It's hard for you to know your own feelings. You're hyper-focused on everyone else's behaviors and experiences, but you have no idea what's going on inside of you. And if, if anyone were to sort of stop you and ask and challenge that, um, there's typically an immediate flood either of anxiety or you shut down, you clamp that down because it would be too frightening in that specific moment to to sort of undo or discover everything that's going on inside of you. Cause it has everything to do with your entire history. Right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, okay. I mean, there's so much to this. Okay. Um, before we, we dive into any of this stuff further, let's, uh, you know, that one in particular or, or the other two, let's, uh, let's keep going along. What's, uh, what's the okay. So then the fourth one is hiding. So this is a big part of either the 
uh, flee response or the freeze response. What, what happens with kids is that they can't typically leave their home. Sometimes they can, they can hide out in their backyard. They can hide out in the neighborhood, but when extreme big T trauma stuff is happening, uh, when fights um, are happening, things are getting thrown in the house, um, upsetting things that sort of threaten your ability to continue living or surviving happen. A kid learns that they're their first mode of protecting themselves is hiding. So this can be in closets. This can be in showers. This can be out in the neighborhood. This can be out in the backyard um, behind a bush somewhere. But what we'll find in adult relationships is an intense need to hide. So those that have experienced really extreme trauma, um, I, it's not uncommon for me to hear stories of them saying, well, something happened. I actually wasn't, I couldn't attend to what was happening. There was just some sort of fight with me and my um, partner. And I found myself sobbing in the shower after afraid that someone was going to come in the bathroom, or I found myself in the back of my closet, hiding behind all of my clothes, or I found myself needing to retreat and just go out to my car um, and shut the doors and lock them for, you know, a period of time. This, this happens in adult relationships, just in a tiny bit of a different way. And it can actually feel quite young. So someone can be in a very adult relationship and some sort of argument happens and they might present uh, temporarily as a young child that's crying in the back of their closet because something has happened. Um, It's not uncommon for that adult to not be able to recount what has happened. Their, their trauma response system has been so activated that it was just get the hell out of there as quick as possible and hide somewhere to help them. Um, so anytime there's like behavior that helps people, um, like get away, they just have to like flee somewhere. They have to be in a a small contained environment. Sometimes this happens with like blankets and clothes, like Mm -hmm. get under your blankets and pile as many of them on top of you as possible in your bed and not move for hours. This is very typical hiding behavior for people that have childhood trauma. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, that one doesn't connect as much for me, but a little bit, uh, definitely had those moments. Um, okay. So, uh, what's, uh, what is number five? Okay. Um, we've already talked a little bit about dissociation, but I'm just going to change the word a little bit to distraction Mm -hmm. and fantasy world. So what a lot of kids do when they're in these really disruptive environments is they create really intense fantasy worlds that help them get the hell out of what they're living in, in that moment that can be through video games that can be in literally in their own mind, making up elaborate fantasy and fairy tales that they can participate in. They can actually have, uh, relationships with these, like, um, you know, people that they, these imaginary friends that kind of come along in adulthood, it typically means that someone has an elaborate fantasy life about anyone other than who they're partnered with. So this can mean if there's any sort of disruption um, in the household, in the relationship, you're just quite not, you're not quite feeling right about it. um, You might start creating it's full of shame, guilt and shame, but you might start creating an elaborate fantasy world about what life might be like with that person, that neighbor, that friend that you rarely have any contact with that outsider that doesn't know you enough to actually challenge you on any of your own behaviors. They're separate enough that they um, offer total relief from the current um, issues that are going on in your life, in your relationship, in your eternal world, um, that sort of thing. Yeah, that one definitely hits home. Um, I definitely I think, found myself doing that. Yeah, I think this one is hard for people to admit, but it's so normal <laughs> when yeah. you come out of trauma. It's what you had to do in childhood, and it offers such an immediate relief. It is Xanax to your relational anxiety, right? To just pick someone like a office mate or a neighbor that you, you know, liked that walked down the street and says hi to you every day. It's important that these people rarely know what's going on. Even if you feel like you have a relationship with them, they've never seen you act a fool. They've never seen any of your vulnerable parts. They've never seen any of your insecurities. And so you're projecting all of your fantasy world onto them as a way of just getting relief from what feels so intolerable at the moment. Yeah. I am fucking 
damaged. Like, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm no, checking. this is normal. No, I every I, box. I, I feel like I'm well, checking every box. You're, you're a survivor. This is what happens. This is this was a, a way of you surviving a really intolerable experience, and I challenge you to come up with a better way to do it. You know, fantasy worlds they do it. Avoidance. That, that hits it right on the, on the head, right? Like this is, this is the best we had when we're kids. Yeah. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. Uh, I just, sometimes I feel, I always uh, make this weird, I don't know if it's weird, but I always make this sort of analogy or this, um, this comparison or whatever, like, like, uh, like my foundation is just, it's, you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't laid properly, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it's sometimes I think, you know, if it was a house, you, people would just, you know, just tear that fucker down. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm not a house, but I mean, that's sort of the way that I look at it, but, but I, I, I am trying, you know, I feel like I'm trying a lot, uh, to, to, to make these changes. Um, but man, it's, it's hard work. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's really hard work. So I, and I want to get into some of that too, but let's, let's hit the last one. Okay. So the last one is over attachment to a trauma figure in an attempt to help them change. Mm. So in childhood, this means that the person that hurts you the most is also the one that feeds you and make sure that you have a home to come to. And as a seven-year-old, there is no way that you can imagine living out on the streets by yourself. So what does this do? This creates an over-attachment to the person that hurts you the most. And you're what you're doing in that is that you're hoping that it will somehow change them, that they will somehow come to their senses and be less erratic if you could just love them in the very specific way that they want to be loved, right? This translates into adult relationships as not having an objective understanding of what's going on in your relationship and overly attaching to people that might hurt you. And instead of challenging some of the ways that they're hurting you, you're trying to love them into being better, love them into being different, which of course doesn't work, but we want it to. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's all of this stuff, all of these strategies, um, coping strategies, whatever you want to call them. I mean, they're, they're really um, born out of, out of the childhood, obviously. I mean, we're discussing that, but like, so how do you, is it even possible to heal or maybe not heal? Well, heal is another thing, but correct these behaviors without Mm -hmm. going back and looking at your childhood. No, I'm of the mind that you have to know what happened to know what you're doing now. I mean, I'm sure that people have been able to sort of sew together some string of coping mechanisms that change their behavior, but we know from a lot of research that behavioral change is temporary unless you have some insight into why it's happening, into why that's important. You have to have buy-in. You have to know um, why you do the things that you do and why you want those to change, right? So from my perspective, you've got to know where that happens. Now, does that mean that everyone needs to dig up every horrific event that happened in their life? No, not really. You do need to understand themes, um, ways in which you had a very specific experience over time, many times over time that led to a way of being in the world and a way of being in relationships. And when that is, when there's some like direct lines drawn between, how you grew up and how you are now, they're much easier um, to address in a real time manner, right? So in relationships that are happening right now, you might be able to sort of catch yourself. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's what I, when I do that hiding thing or, Oh, look, I'm doing that fantasy world. I mean, it's so relieving in some ways to not have the guilt and shame of like, why am I imagining having a full blown affair, marriage, life, children with this person who doesn't even know my middle name? Why is that happening? Um, you know, it's easier for, uh, in my opinion, to have some insight into that. Oh, I'm doing that thing. Okay. So that means that something is going on in my relationship. That's causing me some anxiety and it's causing me to want to flee into my fantasy world. Okay. Well now you can address something, right? It's at least a starting point for you to ask yourself questions. What is going on? How is this playing out? Why is this the thing that I do? Why is this the thing that I do in this specific situation Mm -hmm. instead of perhaps avoiding it or distracting myself in another way? Right. And so let's, let's talk about if we can, um, 
how do you start to, to, to heal from the childhood trauma um, and, and, and change, I guess it's an and question and change some of the coping strategies. From my perspective, I think that, that research and science has really backed this up over anything. This is not just trauma. This is any sort of emotional distress over time is that you've got to know education what's going on and you've got to feel so therapy, mm-hmm. some sort of supportive, reflective space where someone is giving you real time feedback about what's going on. But if you don't know to bring some of those things up, if you aren't open to understanding how, like even listening to this podcast, oh my God, there's six different ways that I might be playing this out in my adult relationships. That is the education thing that we, that I think all healing needs to include. Um, you need things like, Oh, this is what my brain does on trauma. Mm -hmm. This is what trauma is. It's too much, too fast. I mean, even those little tidbits of information can drastically change your relationship to yourself in the middle of really distressing events. So once you have some of that education or concurrently, um, getting some of that education with some sort of supportive, insightful, reflective practice. Some of that happens individually. I do not recommend that in trauma, get into a group, talk to someone, honestly, get a sponsor. If you're in a substance abuse, um, community, get a therapist, uh, do something that someone is literally paying attention, looking you in your eyes and saying, what in the hell was that about? Let's talk all about it. Uh, and providing you with some real time feedback about what's going on. I think that that's kind of the magic sauce of how we overcome trauma. And what I, I, I hate generalizing and, and I'm, I'm just probably, it's not a fair question, but let's say someone does that and they say, okay, I'm going to go do these things. I'm learning I'm listening to this podcast and maybe, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do some other research about whatever one hits home in particular. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'm going to go to therapy or a support group or whatever. And, I, and I'm a man. So I, I can hear the men going, how long is this going to take? Mm-hmm. Like, is this a six month thing? Is this a nine month thing? Is this a mm-hmm. 10 year thing? Yeah, I can, I can understand everyone's urgency, but I doubt that that's a man thing. I think that's a trauma thing that they, we all want to get the hell out of our unbearable experiences as quickly as possible. So some of that might've been socialized into men a little bit more than it is women, but I think it's actually a trauma response and not a gendered response. So I think that I, I would just sort of encourage you to say, okay, so I'm feeling some urgency. That's probably about the intensity of my feelings and not about anything else. It's just that I'm feeling something very intensely and I want to get away from that. And I am both biologically and socially primed for that to get away from everything that is uncomfortable. There's not anything that we can do to change that, but in trauma, we do have to try to slow down and stay more present in the uncomfortable, just a tiny bit longer than what we're used to. So if you have a three nanosecond tolerance for trauma, we're going to try to get you up to one second. (laughs) So it's just a a gradual growing of the tolerance of what happened that felt unbearable at a time. um, And it doesn't have to be so unbearable now. And, And just a note about this is that there's, there's a lot out there, um, that points to the fact that kids, when they are experiencing these really horrific events that create a trauma response in them, they are actually intolerable to a seven-year-old, a nine-year-old, a 10-year-old that, that sort of interpretation of the event is right on the money. But when we remain sort of steadfast in that interpretation of our feelings, when we're adults, we're shortchanging ourselves that the way that you felt when you were nine, when something was unbearable was right. And now that you're 29, 39, 49, you have way more at your disposal that would make those feelings a little bit more tolerable. So again, we're just building tolerance over time to what was really intolerable. Yeah. And let's, let's hone in on that a little bit. So uh, I see it all the time. I, I run two support groups, uh, for guys going through divorce. Um, and, and you get those introductory posts. This is, I'm, I am lost. I am, I can't take this pain. It's too painful. Mm-hmm. I'm so hurt. Um, 
we want that person to to sit with that. But can we can we try and describe that as best as best we can, as 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 nuanced as we can? Um, what does that man do in that moment? And this is this is sort of going to tie into the last question, but I, I, maybe I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. But I really want to focus on that man who just found out, and and he is just he he doesn't know what to do with himself. What what can he do? I guess to sort of start healing, but also sort sort of to start tolerating how painful it is. I think tolerance is second. The first thing that has to happen is a robust self-care practice. What I find with men who are going through a divorce is that they have relied on someone else to pay attention to them and to comfort them in some way. And they are totally, they, they feel totally inept at doing that for themselves. So my process is really to start with what in the world feels good to you? How often are you doing that? Once a year is not enough. (laughs) We got to do it more. Um, like once a day, you need to have some robust practice of comfort, self-assurance, um, reminding yourself that you're going to be okay, reminding yourself that you can take one, you know, one step further. Um, And so I think before we start the healing, it's just gathering up all of the pieces and saying, when I got home, I was used to what happening when I walked in the door and that was comforting and now I don't have it. So what am I going to replace that with? Is that um, setting up a playlist that feels comforting that I turn on right when I walk in the door? Is that putting on comfy pants? Is that exercising and getting out all of my anxious energy? Is that setting on the porch and just feeling the breeze? Like just something that can replace what used to happen that someone is feeling some loss over. And we try to build up that practice where um, I try to get my patients to at least a list of 50 things that feel good before we start any sort of emotional tolerance. Why? Because when emotions come up, it is so upsetting. If you have a traumatic childhood and now you're going through a divorce, how in the world do you expect yourself to tolerate anything when you have no plan? for comforting yourself. So the plan for comfort, self-care, reassurance, anything that sort of scaffolds you and shores you up, that is primary before we start any sort of tolerance practice. Now to answer your question, the tolerance practice is just to add minutes of being present in your experience. So if you can truly only tolerate a few seconds, then you do a few seconds and then you go and you do something that feels good, healthy and good. And then- And then when you feel like, okay, I'm ready to do more, or these feelings are coming up a little bit more rapidly, I can't keep them at bay. Okay. Sit in it a little bit longer, discuss these things with your friends, get some feedback, but comfort yourself in the aftermath. So when we're talking about, and I want, I want this, this is the part I want to get sort of nuanced in. And because I think for me, who's someone that's been through trauma, like sitting with feelings is so foreign to me. So Mm -hmm. can we define that? Like, what do you, do we mean writing things down? talking about it or just simply thinking about it? Like, what does it mean to sit with the feelings? Any of those things. Mm -hmm. But the end goal is for you to have some awareness of what is actually going on in your body at that time and Mm -hmm. what feelings those actually are. So we might start with something as simply as simple as a feelings wheel. You can get these anywhere online, download that shit, print it out, put it on your wall, uh, put it in your car, put it in your wallet. And when you feel some of something, sorrow, you start on the outside of the wheel and you work yourself towards the primary feeling on the inside of the wheel. Okay. That's sadness. What in the world do I do with sadness? You have no idea. No problem. We'll get there. You'll create some practice around how to feel better in the sadness, but just identifying it is the first thing. And then to be able to actually feel it in your body in real time. If you have no idea what you're feeling most of the day, Your job is just to try to sit a little bit and identify feelings Mm -hmm. because once that starts become a, starts to become a little bit more of a practice, you'll get to a place to where you're like, Oh God, my chest hurts so bad because of all of this anxiety that's thrumming around. But that was so automatic Mm -hmm. to identify that that was so automatic because you're aware of what's going on. Now, the next step is trying to figure out how to help yourself in that moment. Mm-hmm. And what that might mean and where it comes from and how you can untangle yourself from that. I want to, I want to ask you about distraction versus doing 
uh-huh. you know, the work and, and, and you talked about, you know, finding comfort and whatever that means. Is there a, um, how do you know if you're, is like, are you just, how do you know if you're distracting yourself too much? If you're, if you're, you know, if you're leaning on things a little bit too much or like, how do you, where does it become unhealthy versus healthy distraction? You know what I'm saying? I, yes. And I think that that's an individual question. I think as you start to piece together, you know, whatever your healing path is going to be, there's going to be times where you were running every day, like literally exercising via running. And that felt good. And that felt like you weren't in your home, sad and depressed and suicidal. Right. And then there's going to come a time where you're turning down social engagements, ways of getting support, moments of connection with neighbors, because you've got to get that number of miles in that day. Yeah. So I think that we have to sort of what starts as one thing can end up another. Sure. And then we've got to over or we've got to correct ourselves again. We've got to come back from the overcorrection. But that's really an individual thing. I think I would just ask what is this serving? And when the answer is it's helping me feel less terrible, then let's continue. When it starts to impede on other things that are good for you, like social support, ways of connecting with others, especially after divorce, connection is hard. So we will find all kinds of ways to both long for it and avoid it. Mm -hmm. Right. So there has to be some sort of, um, what we would call in the psychology world, observing ego, a place that you can observe your own behaviors and be like, I wonder what that's about. And it was good at one time. And we're, we're kind of moving into that unhealthy. Um, yeah, this, this stuff is, uh, there's, it's so complex. I think there's so much to it. Uh, I don't think mm-hmm. it's, I don't think it's a, there's a simple, there's, there isn't like a quick fix, right? Uh, there isn't a, 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 a simple answer to this stuff. Right. Which I think is why, I mean, if, if there was sort of a fly on the wall in any of my therapy sessions, just listening to me, not what anyone else says, you might see that there's some themes we're kind of coming back to some of the same things over and over and over with different people, different walks of life. But the majority of sessions are going to ask the question of what exactly was that about for you? What impact does it have? Where is that sitting with you now? What would it mean to move away from it? What would it mean to move closer to it? And that is so individual. I think this is why it's important to get very individualized support um, for things like this, because it is so nuanced. I want everyone to be educated. I want everyone to feel sort of shored up with the knowledge. But if you start feeling stuck in a way because the um, generalized advice is not necessarily hitting, or it's not moving along some of those dynamics, you might just need a little bit more individualized support. Someone that's sort of listening to this and saying, uh, I have some concerns about your running behavior. I have some concerns about your avoidance of everything social. What in the world is that about? How can I help you there? I want to, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. And I think we'll, 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 uh, make this the last question, but before the last question, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, in terms of, so I see a lot, I see a lot of men, uh, my Facebook, one of my Facebook groups, uh, I didn't start it, but I run it. It's, it's, it's near 5,000. Uh, and so it's, it's, I see, I see every, uh, scenario I've seen it and I, and I've read it. And, and I think there's a tendency as, as men to, um, you know, man up, like get over it, move on. Um, I, I'm not, I don't subscribe to that. I think it's, it's horseshit, but there, I do think there is a time where you do have to sort of start focus, start focusing on what your future looks like mm-hmm. and how to get there versus staying sort of stuck in the rumination of, mm-hmm. like, I can't believe she did this. Why would she mm-hmm. do this? This hurts so much, you know, money, kids, you know, all these things that suck, mm-hmm. but, and you have to transition. And, and I think it's probably an individualized question and answer, but is there sort of a, I know I, I hear one year in terms of like, you know, not mm. dating and those kinds of things, but like, is there a, um, a time frame? at what point do I say to a man, bro, come it's on time. now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, like, yeah, 
I, I don't have a time for these things because it sort of matters what happened in the relationship and, and how that person came into the relationship. But I do love to think and explore with my patients, the idea of responsibility. What can you take responsibility for? It would never be everything. Right. And of course this sucks that we can be both validated in what's going on in our lives and we can take responsibility for parts of it, for not addressing trauma before we got into a marriage, for passing that on in some sort of, you know, complex, difficult to imagine or understand dynamic with a spouse or now an ex-spouse um, and maybe even a co-parent at the time, right? Like there's, there's something to be said about uh, what is my responsibility here? And I think that that is trying to figure out what what is on my side of the street to clean up, to handle, to manage, to, to make sure that we're kind of, um, doing right by myself and others. And I think that that is a question of responsibility. No, and, and no one is hundred percent responsible ever. So if you are thinking that, um, we've got some work to do on how you might be able to take in your own kind of responsibility, even if you're taking responsibility for something that came out of trauma. That's a tricky space for people to navigate. It's not your fault that you felt like you needed to hide um, after an explosive fight. It is your responsibility to change it because that's never going to be a way that healthy adult relationships can function well long-term. I lied. I'm going to ask you one more thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it just popped in my head. How, 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 what do you think the percentages of actually healthy adults and, and, and then therefore relationships in this country? Cause it seems to me, mm. nobody has these fucking skills. Maybe, mm. maybe I'm cynical and I'm wrong, but like, mm -hmm. what, is there a number? Do you think, you know, like, I'm sure there is. I am unaware of what that's, that statistic is. I would say that you and I are, we have a contaminated, uh, sampling pool. That's and research. Um, we have to be aware of like where we're getting our, our information. And um, if you're running a big Facebook group that has a lot of disgruntled and upset and hurt men, and I'm a trauma therapist that's spending 40 hours um, a week talking to either patients or even on podcasts like this um, about the horrific things that happen in relationships, then our own view of what is statistically normal is well out of reach of what is actually representative of the population. So I don't know that statistic. I'm sure it's available. Um, it probably some of the social psychologists or positive psychologists out there are way more aware of what's going well in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more aware of what's not going so well in the world. So I want to, I want to take this just a little further, uh, and, and apologies, but, um, do you ever find yourself overwhelmed with all that you hear and see? And do you, do you have strategies to deal with because it must be, I can imagine it be, it's frustrating for me when, and I'm not trying to compare us, but you know, if you're a doctor, I'm just a dude. Um, but like I get guys all the time and I'm trying to help. And it's like, they just doesn't seem like whatever I'm doing is helping or, or, or they're not listening or, or whatever it is. But like, um, do you find yourself, like, how do you, do you, for A, do you get frustrated with people? How can you, how can you not, but maybe, maybe that's part of your training and B when, how do you deal with that? Uh, I guess, I guess it's just self-care, but how do you deal with, cause you're, you're not hearing like happy go lucky shit mm -hmm. all the time. So how do you mm -hmm. deal with that? I do think that I had exceptional training, um, in my doctoral program that really taught me to, how to understand where people are coming from. And it does feel, it feels so, oh my gosh, it's not personal at all. Yeah. Um, and so I, I don't walk around often feeling like, um, it does happen, of course, but sure. mostly that's about, oh my gosh, what happened in that specific session mm. that left me feeling helpless and I get angry around helplessness. Mm. So now that's about me. That's yeah. about my own helplessness and how I want that person to feel better so badly. And, and I haven't thought of how to do that yet. And so my own helplessness will kind of make me mad, but that's not about that person, yeah. but that's good training. That's, mm. that's not anything that, you know, I was born with. That's just something that I have been taught over time. 
of really how to understand what's playing out in the therapy session in a way that gives lots and lots of room for people to be right and wrong and frustrated and imbalanced and distressed and all of that good stuff. I will also say, this is one of the things that I have to, um, say out loud a lot, both on social media and whatever, is that I have to charge a certain amount to be able to only see a certain amount of patients because I'm useless to everyone if I get burned out. And that is one of the hardest parts of being a therapist because I'd like to provide it for free to anyone that I could, but to pay my bills and to not I uh, feel resentful on behalf of my bonus children and to walk through this world feeling like I am able to buy a cup, cup of coffee. If that's what helps me feel joy that day, that only happens if I see a certain amount of patients and I have to charge for that, um, which I think is very off putting to people who come in and they're like, how do, how does a trauma patient afford your fee? And the answer is some of them do. And some of them I have to find different services for. Um, but that's one of the ways that I manage burnout is I have a, a very strict limit with the number of patients that I see in any given week. It also means that I have a wait list for things like this. And and that's why is because I can only see a certain number, even if that person really wants to work with me. And that's like the highest honor that anyone would ever give me. I still have to say, I'm so sorry. I either have to send you somewhere else or I have to put you on a wait list because I have a hard, hard, hard limit around this. That's smart. Did, was that something you developed over time? Or, or Certainly, yeah. certainly no grad student that's starting out being a therapist has any boundaries because we're taught that those are somehow mean and rude to everyone. So we teach everyone about boundaries, but we as therapists are not able to have it. So it's a lot of undoing. Um, I loved my training. I, th- I think it was exceptional in some ways and in other ways um, it, you know, it, it created more trauma. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. think it is life trauma. I mean, it, it can be, but I, I will say that there are plenty of people out there in the world that are well supported. They have a lot of different ways in which they can get their needs met, whether that's financial or socially or whatever. And they are less likely to have some of these really bad outcomes that the people that you and I talk with every day do. And that does exist out there. And we're just trying to maybe change a generation and to be more of that instead of more of this. So, yeah. well, I, I want to wrap up with the, with the last question. Okay. Um, you know, we, we sort of touched on this, but, um, uh, any words of wisdom, advice, whatever you want to call it, um, to the man who just found out, he just got told, just got served papers, just she just left, or you know, she just said you need to get out. You know, do you have any any words of wisdom to that man? I would say that your primary job in this season is to figure out how you are going to fill the hole um, that is left by that relationship ending. That is not with a new relationship. That is with. Uh, finding ways to take care of yourself, finding ways to comfort, finding ways to identify how you're doing in the world, uh, because that is the first step to the rest of your life and doing this a different way in the future. So there's no pressure to not feel completely shitty about what's happened. There's no pressure to hurry up and get over it. Your only job today is to add one more thing to the list of something that feels good. Well, Quincy, I I want to thank you so, so much. This was was my pleasure. Yeah, I, uh, hopefully we can do it again. Um, how can great. people uh, find you uh, on the on the interwebs? They can find me. I'm mostly on Instagram at Dr. Quincy. That's two E's at the end. My parents gave me that lovely <laughs> gift <laughs> in life. I will also say that any of that uh, worldwide coaching or that education happens at traumastery.com. So uh, like monastery, but traumastery. Um, cool. Yeah, we're trying to help people heal from the inside out. And there's lots and lots and lots of resources there. So we'd love to have anyone and everyone over there. If that feels good, we actually have um, a really good course coming out in the next few months about betrayal trauma. So this is the trauma that happens after cheating and lying or some sort of big betrayal that happens um, in relationships. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, as you should be. Well, well, thank you again for for coming on. And uh, I I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Take care. Thank you so much for watching and or listening. Thank you to Nick Coyle and Lifer for allowing me to use their song, Born Again, which you're hearing now and at the intro to the podcast. Thank you to Justin Dolahanty and all of my brothers at The Alpha Code. 
please visit the website risingphoenixpodcast.com to connect with me and other like-minded men who are looking to thrive and grow after their divorce. And remember to surround yourself with people who add value to your life, who challenge you to be greater than you were yesterday, who sprinkle magic into your existence like you do to theirs. Life is not meant to be done alone. Find your tribe. Take care.